broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Will's Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wills. Aboriginal affairs, welfare and justice in modern Australia has gone from a carefully considered public policy issue to another toxic aspect of the, the culture wars with knee-jerk uh, responses tending to be uh, announced or virtue signalling responses when it comes to, to left-wing uh, governments and it's been injected with harmful identity politics. Uh, this month marks uh, 30 years since uh, the final report uh, by the uh, Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which the Keating government, oh, sorry, I should say the Hawke uh, government uh, initiated. Uh, we are told 30 years later that there is still an epidemic in Australia of uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody. But what is the, the reality of this uh, situation and also the, the aspect of uh, how to deal with well uh, uh, cr uh, cr the criminal justice system when it comes to Aboriginal Australians. Well, uh, tonight I, it's my pleasure to be joined by Dr. Anthony Dillon. He's a highly respected uh, academic on uh, Aboriginal uh, affairs. He uh, identifies both with his uh, Aboriginal ancestry and non-Aboriginal uh, ancestry. He's a lecturer at the Australian Catholic university and uh, he also also has uh, contributed to many books they're the most recent uh, that's your cue anthony uh, a yeah. chapter in uh, cancel culture which is a a book edited by dr kevin donnelly an uh, education expert uh, where obviously uh, anthony's chapter is about uh, the well the the uh, the, the, the polarization that's been injected into uh, the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. Anthony, it's great to have you on Wilms Front. Oh, thank you. Great to be here, Tim. And uh, it's what? You got the summary all right, except for the, the uh, well-respected academic. I don't know. It depends on who you speak to. Uh, well, I respect <laughs> you. So that, 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 that was my, that, that's my own personal opinion. <laughs> Thank you. And now you've had a what is it, a a busy night because earlier you were on uh, Sky News with uh, P uh, Peter Credlin, and it certainly seems the the week to have someone like you on the show uh, because not only is it the the anniversary of this uh, Royal Commission into to Aboriginal deaths in custody thirty years ago, there's also a, a a youth crime summit happening in in Queensland at the at the moment where I live in Victoria, I don't know much about this, but it's one of those things where they talk about youth youth crime in particularly northern Queensland. It's sort of one of the things you read into that it's largely, sadly, Aboriginal youths. I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, 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 the youth Summit. I'm not sure how much you know about the uh, the youth crime issue in in Queensland. As I said, I only see uh, w hear about it when it's on the news. Yeah, today was the first day I'd heard about it. But I, you know, the, the summit. But yeah, for years we've heard about uh, the problem of youth crime, particularly in those northern parts of the state. Uh, which, by the way, I was born in the north of the state as well. So. Um, you know, I, I do feel some affiliation for Northern Queensland. Now, I know that uh, the, the LNP, uh, when it came to the, the Queensland state election, uh, Deb Frecklington's well, signature policy to tackle youth crime in Northern Queensland was to introduce a curfew for, for youth, which I was in Victoria at the time we were subjected to a curfew in, in Melbourne. Uh, so that that particularly didn't wash uh, well with us here, a, a government proposing a, a curfew. Uh, what's your own thoughts on that sort of idea, that the solution to that would be just to, if there's any youths after a certain hour, just round them up? Yeah, look, um, good intention, so I'm not going to knock um, 
people who offer that as an idea. Because one of the problems is people need to, they need a sense of autonomy. Um, so telling them what time you can and stay out and cannot stay out uh, is seen as a threat to their autonomy and they often react back and, you know, will go against the very thing you're trying to impose on them. Certainly some sort of action needs to be taken and I, I think it, you know, we need to focus on the, well, we need to focus on the parents and the, the kids themselves. And these problems are always like you have a boat with a few holes in it, water's getting in. If you only plug up one or two of the holes, water's still going to get in through the unplugged holes and the boat's going to sink. So we do need to try and cover all bases and that largely is focusing on, uh, you know, the role of parents, the kids themselves, uh, authorities and, you know, any other stakeholders. Um, we need to change the paradigm. Certainly, um, as I was saying tonight with Peter, we want to make it such that homes and their, their communities, their neighbourhoods, far more attractive than going into a detention centre. And for some of these kids, going to a descent, detention centre is better than being at home. And people don't like to hear that. I'm not saying it's the same for every uh, kid in every home, but many of them, especially the Indigenous kids, prefer to be in a detention centre because it's, it's safer, they get meals, they're looked after there. Um, and, you know, speak, thinking long term, we've got to have communities and neighbourhoods where adults are working and where it's normal for kids to see adults working. And when you've got adults working, you, you have a vibrant community. Um, you know, schools are vibrant because schools are part of the the community you attract good teachers and things spiral up instead of spiraling it down uh, you know that's the big picture because occasionally we've we've heard about well not just a dysfunction in those uh, northern queensland remote communities but uh, tribal violence uh, as as well there was a few years back uh, some community workers authorities had to be evacuated there and based on what you've said if there's that sort of tribal warfare going on just as an example in a community then for a youth yeah it's not an attractive place to be no exactly um and you know although it's even sad i guess some of them get used to it um which is just as sad but you know breaking that cycle and it's so sad to see we've got so many indigenous leaders most many of i don't disagree i don't agree with them but one thing i do respect about them is that they're in a leader of authority okay they're in a position of influence and most of them have got there because they do have a a good education uh, some of them has, have graduated with uni degrees. So they're good role models. What I would like to see them doing is, um, you know, extending being role models for these people uh, and so that the community lift these leaders up as role models as well, you know, putting aside their politics, but say, you know, this is what you can do. Um, and also bring in, you know, you got not just, the, the leaders can include sports celebrities as well. And, you know, normally most sports celebrities get to where they are because they have, they've learnt discipline, um, they've learnt to train, um, they generally have a good education. So, Because uh, if you don't have a good education, you end up sitting, you know, in the car park of the 7-Eleven or, or whatever. Now, one of the well, the or the, the 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 social media class, I should say, they're driving this. It's called the the raise the age campaign. That's their the hashtag. Raise the the age of criminal responsibility. They want to well, they uh, they want to raise it from ten to fourteen. Now, the age of criminal responsibility is when you can be prosecuted, go through the justice system for a crime that you've committed uh, uh, below the age of 10, uh, you, you can't be uh, prosecuted. And apparently this is going to be a, 
a, a good way to, to keep youths out of the, the justice system. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to argue that, say, a 12-year-old who steals a Snickers bar from the supermarket de uh, it deserves to go to jail for that. That's not what we're talking about here. But uh, I think the, the reason why this campaign, to, or to put it politely, is misplaced, uh, that we don't want a situation where, because there have been around the world, a, those in the, the young teens who've uh, committed heinous acts, which obviously need to be punished, go through the, the, the justice system. Yeah. And I mean, when you say punished, I'd be careful with that word. And you, you said justice system in, in the same sense. So um, yeah, we want uh, uh, like clumsy language by me. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, certainly we want justice, you know, so we want restoration restitution to the victims yeah and that's the restitution yeah ultimately um we, we want the kid to be get back on the right track and if it's just a, a blunt punishment without meaning they're less likely to get back on track um so we should be f focusing on justice less so on punishment and that doesn't mean we give them a picnic um we do want them to think, you know, I don't want to be doing this again. Um, but, you know, if they are going to be kept separate from others, we want them learning. We want them um, to have opportunities to gain new skills, uh, a bit of self-discovery, that sort of thing. And, you know, we want to remind them that they're human and that they have potential and they can get back into mainstream life um but only after it's deemed that they are that community is safe from them and they're safe from themselves as well and so you know there are a lot of variables to consider if i channel back to what year 11 legal studies uh, it, the the correct terms about the aims of the justice system are uh, restitution uh, retribution, rehabilitation, and uh, deterrence. And obviously, it, 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 there's with certain types of uh, corrections orders, that's, uh, that's the, the official name for our, our, uh, our prison and or uh, com community, community service orders is the, the correction system. They're obviously... There, there have been cases of, uh, if I be more specific, Aboriginal uh, youths committing quite uh, aggravated violent crimes. I mean, we've heard with this, uh, with this uh, uh, youth summit about uh, car thefts, uh, uh, car, uh, carjackings, which obviously can be quite frightening to people in those communities. And this is why there is this the this summit there there is obviously if you've been a victim of of crime no matter if it's a young teenager or, or not you want to it, it, you would want them or well, a way that they can't hurt anyone else but yep. uh, obviously what you're getting at there is that obviously we don't want them in and out of the the, the justice system so What's what's needed to for true rehabilitation, uh, particularly amongst amongst youths? Okay, I guess what I um, was saying before, we want communities and neighbourhoods where they see the adults working as normal, and if you've got an uncle or even a father or an auntie, and they've had a life of crime it's very easy to think I want to be just like him or if I am like him, that'll be fine. He gets by. Um, and so we, you know, want this picture out of their heads and we, we want to replace it with an another picture, someone who's successful in life. Um, someone lives, who lives in a safe place, someone who has lots of friends and someone who has opportunity and choices. So they're not just stuck in a ghetto or, or a particular neighborhood. 
they're free to roam the country and, and roam the world. Um, so it's replacing one bad picture with another with a, a better picture and letting the young person know, you know, we've, we've got people who believe in you and can help you achieve your dreams. Okay? So you can, you know, point out that you can be like him, you can be like her, you can do that, you can have all of that too. Um, I remember Noel Pearson, you know, had the, the catchphrase once, from Cape York to New York. Um, so he wants, you know, one of the Aboriginal kids up there to know that the world is their, their backyard. Obviously, my next question should be, how do you break that cycle? And a lot of uh, Australians, they, they, they see these uh, remote communities and think, well, in any remote rural area, there's not much opportunity and my uh, with obviously I, I've investigated this uh, uh, these communities a bit more the fact that there's not uh, property rights entrepreneurial rural yeah. opportunities the fact that the Aboriginal the the way that uh, Aboriginal land rights are awarded it's 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 almost like a collectivist socialist system there there is a a there are two different uh, schools of thought that uh, you need property rights in proper property rights in in rural and remote Aboriginal communities, and then there's also another school of thought that maybe just the taxpayer government support should be cut off; that they should be incentivized to migrate away from them to the regions or even cities where there's there's opportunities. I know. Was that former Prime Minister Tony Abbott? He got he uh, got into trouble for his statement when he was uh, asked a question about the the Western Australian Barnett government's decision to to basically close uh, rem some remote Aboriginal communities that taxpayers can't continue to fund lifestyle choices. So I'll ask. So I'll, I'll get you to explain your your views on those two issues. Yeah, so in that sense, it wasn't really closing the community. It was just saying we won't pay you to sit there anymore. Um, they could if they wanted to, but they they would have to, you know, start generating their own electricity and and that sort of thing. And just with regard to Tony Abbott, there, yes, lifestyle choices was, you know, that, that was something that the left latched onto, and it was quite refreshing to watch Paul Murray on Sky News show you the whole interview with Tony Abbott and with that term lifestyle choices in context. And I've seen Tony taken out of context before. I was with him once and, you know, the, um, if we have time, I'll talk about it on, on your program. It was a terrible uh, injustice where, you know, he was just taken out of context. I was with him and I saw the what was shown on SBS. It was very wrong. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the lifestyle choices thing was not, a bad thing again when you look at what Paul Murray did where he showed the whole interview it was very contextualized it was good uh, now coming back to the earlier thing about um, land property rights and that sort of thing yes that's the sort of thing I know that people like Warren Mundine have been interested in but you do need people um, if they are living in these areas to be able to have the same rights as you and I to be able to get a bank loan and that sort of thing and say you know this is my my bit of land and i'm going to you know set up a business on it or or whatever and i don't fully understand the, the whole uh system it is complicated but we do need the and th this is the sort of thing um you look at the work of uh helen and mark hughes where they spent a lot of time talking about this in publications in the center print for independent studies but at the end of the day in these remote areas um if people are going to stay there and i'm all for government investing a few million if it's sustainable and again i'd like someone like warren mundine to head that portfolio looking at the development in remote areas because he has um he can see a lot more potential where others can't but um yeah so you know if those areas are sustainable keep the people there um, make sure that the, the property rights are the same as they are for you and I. But in some cases where there's just nothing, or very little, 
and there's, and there's just sit down money, it's time to think about a sensitive, sensible exit strategy. And Stan Grant has spoken about this in a, a fantastic um, uh, interview where he just said, you know, you do have it requires some hard choices to make, and it can mean moving the people uh, up in, into, in, you know, not just ripping them out of the land, but creating opportunities to where they can go to where there's more opportunities for them. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, it does. But I'll add a another dimension into this. If which I just, can I just read a quote from Stan Grant? Yes. Go for yeah. it. So this, oh, this is about five or six years ago. Stan Grant said, we have become a more urbanised world. We live longer because of it. We have greater access to jobs and education health. My family moved around wherever my dad could get work because he had to work to put food on the table. I was fortunate enough to go to university. I have a career that has taken me around the world. And my cultural connection, my spiritual connection, my family connection to that land is as strong today as what it was growing up. And I'm no different to other people in that we can have that. It requires some really hard choices to be made. And so I guess the point Stan was making there was that his father um, had to move around to where he could get work. And if there's no work in these places, you know, if after someone like Warren Mundine goes there and says, look, you know, there's really not much we can do because he is, he is a man of vision and very entrepreneurial when it comes to um, employment. If someone like he says no, well, then we have to move the people out. And you can put up these arguments, well, you know, that's, it's, they're living on country, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like to think, if you were to go back a couple of hundred years and, you know, the people who are living there now go back and visit their great-great-grandparents, give them a crystal ball and say, in 200 years, in 2021, this is what your great-great-great-grandchildren are going to be living like. I don't think they would be happy. They see them living there in squalor, drinking, playing cards, that sort of thing. So yes, if there's no hope for those communities, move them out. Do it sensitively and sensibly. Guide them gently, but move them out. The other dimension that uh, I was, I'm going to add to, to this discussion is obviously the uh, identity uh, uh, politics, culture warriors who have poisoned this, uh, well, the, these practical discussions so uh, intensely that basically, if there, there there was this move by by government to was it shift a Aboriginal community, it would be called cultural uh, genocide, and a lot of these. Uh, 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 these uh, left-wing activists, uh, anti-development, have have, you, have held Aboriginal people back by claiming, no, there can't be a, a mine here. They, they get a few local elders to say this is sacred, these trees are sacred, this cave is, is, is sacred, and that gets uh, amplified in the, the news cycle. The ABC or The Guardian can interview these people to say this is the destruction of our culture, and, and this is why sensible uh, uh, discussions of these issues uh, is only limited to well, shows such as this, uh, uh, Sky News programs, uh, because, it, and I was talking about uh, social media uh, before, I mean, that is, it's such a, a toxic influence with the most reactionary types of identity politics getting prominence there. Yeah, look, you raised some good points. You said the word poison, um, which is so true. The minds have been poisoned, and you threw in that word genocide, which is what they love to do all the time. You know, cultural genocide, which is, you know, it's about as meaningful as the term transgenerational trauma. Um, you know, it's just a vague, impressive sounding term, but when you unpack it, there's really not much there. And with regard to getting elders to, you said something about elders will say something. Well, they'll um, get uh, these anti-development yeah. 
eldest that they'll get some or well, pe people who proclaim that they're elders to say this is a sacred site you can't develop this that sort of thing that's yeah. what i was getting and dave and best price have told me that's what happens they call them rent an elder okay you can get an elder give them a few bucks uh and i know people are going to hate me for saying this but and i'm not saying it's, it happens every time an elder speaks but i'm saying it does happen where you can you know pay an elder a few bucks a nice meal whatever and he or she will say whatever you want them to say. Um, so we need to be careful uh, when we make decisions based on what an elder may have said. That's certainly one bit of information, but a lot more information is needed than just the you know the voice of the well-respected elder uh, person. Now, what else were you saying? I wanted to say something else. Um, there was something. What else did you say in that last question or comment? As about social media, how that the because of how yeah. amplified it is now in the the public debate, that sensible discussions that uh, uh, we're having and that well, that uh, yeah. you're able to have on some Sky News programs uh, get drowned out by well these you know, hashtags uh, about uh, 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 decrying or well, the destruction of Aboriginal culture that sort of thing. Yeah, and the mistreatment of Aboriginal people and that, all that sort of thing. And it comes from the usual suspects, you know, the Guardian, for one. And it, sadly now, or has been for some time, but I've been very disappointed to see Amnesty speak absolute trash where Aboriginal affairs are concerned. And, you know, um, social media, it, it is a great tool, but it is a tool. And unfortunately, it's given a voice to the village idiot as well, who can say what they want to say. And, you know, because of the way we've become as a society, um, we, you know, we like to play the part of rescuer. And when we, when we hear a bad news story or, you know, a story that's presented as a b bad news story, well, then, yeah, um, social media is just a good way of collecting th tens of thousands of voices to voice an opinion. And we, we see that no, nowhere has that been clearer. And because you opened with this about deaths in custody, yes, it is this, this week is the 30th anniversary uh, of the, the final report. And I, I see um, uh, a red tie today. Article here for, for news.com.au, yeah. which, well, so I'll allow another, good, another good player, news.com, um, uh, allowing different voices to be heard and I, I see Pat Dodson had some comments today and it, you know, it usually seems to be the same thing. I'll talk about, you know, whether it be 460, 470 Aboriginal people have died in custody since the Royal Commission began. That is a useless statistic to give. The way it's given without mentioning any uh, the non-Aboriginal deaths which are proportionately higher, uh, in, you know, in proportion to the number of people in custody. It's grossly misleading. The average person would think that um, it's only ever Aboriginal people who die in custody. And I have a friend, lovely friend, really lovely. Uh, you know, I would never fight or argue with her. She's just it's a beautiful person. But when Black Lives Matter was in full swing six months ago, 12 months ago, or whatever, she arranged to have a vigil on her front yard at 4.32 in the afternoon because 4.32 was the, the magic number that was being used for number of deaths in custody. Um, you know, 432. Yes, that, uh, that, that was uh, a thing when we should say that, or I call it Black Lives Matter 2.0, was imported from the, the, the U.S., which the thing that always perplexed me about what well, the the left is always against the Americanization of Australia. You know, they were happy to import, and, and they uh, they of course uh, lump uh, pe people of color as some collective homogenous blob, which obviously African American people culture is completely. It, 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 it's a completely different issue. They're completely different people from Aboriginal Australians. Yeah. But coming back to what I was saying, this beautiful friend of mine, 
Um, so she had a gather, gathering at 4.32 in the afternoon, 4.32 to represent the 432 Black Lives Lost in Custody. And I just politely said, and uh, any mention of the more than 1,500 non-Aboriginal deaths in custody in the same time period. Uh, so that generated an interesting discussion with her friends and I. But uh, it's very wicked and criminal, I believe, to talk about those 450, 60, whatever it is, deaths in custody without giving the comparison of the number of non-Aboriginal deaths in custody. So whatever deaths in custody is discussed, that should be front and centre. And, of course, the other information which most of us know by now, as I mentioned in that article, and um, it's so refreshing now that whenever I do see, you know, one of those articles from The Guardian and the ABC or SBS trying to stir up uh, the vision and they talk about Aboriginal people, you know, being slaughtered in jail, there's many, many people now who will be quickly remind others, hey, Aboriginal people in custody are less likely to die than non-Aboriginal people in custody. Let's not forget that. And, you know, so, yes, it's a problem, and nobody denies it's a problem, the over-incarceration of Indigenous people. Yes, we would like to bring that down. But it's, you know, good to know, if, if you can use that word good, perhaps not good for non-Indigenous people, but when in custody, an Indigenous person is less likely to die than a non-Indigenous person in custody. Um, and that should be the leading remark, leading comment any time there's a story on Aboriginal deaths in custody. And we know, you know, the usual suspects are reluctant to do that. It's only through channels like this and Sky and, and the Australian to an extent where they will tell you that the truth, it's, you know, a bit of a truth bomb. Now, we had a, another Royal Commission uh, the past decade into to youth justice in the Northern Territory, which was uh, triggered by Four Corners episode, which showed uh, Dylan Voller uh, in uh, a spit hood uh, uh, being uh, restrained. And obviously, he then became a, a, a poster boy for, for Aboriginal injustice, even though he is uh, the, the reason yes. why he been imprisoned was for very uh, violent crimes and and I think this was announced the, the the next day by Malcolm Turnbull he was prime minister at the time and this is what I was saying in my introduction it was a a knee jerk uh, response and we we're just talking about the the 30 years since the uh, since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in, in custody, I think Royal Commissions are way too overused that if a government has a problem, they just basically smash the, the Royal Commission glass to use in an emergency. And often these Royal Commissions don't deliver good recommendations. And if governments realise that they're not good recommendations, then they're criticised by the media for not implementing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's just my you're, commissions. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, and look, if we look at the um, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, it stated um, from day one what was known, and that is that Aboriginal people in custody are less likely likely to die than non-Aboriginal people in custody. But that kind of got swept away. No one wanted to hear that. And I should add too. I mean, I've been saying this for nearly a decade now, and that statistic um, was criticised severely in the early days, told that I was complicit with the murders, you know, an Aboriginal death in custody is seen as a murder. And I, I saw in an article in this, uh, the Australian Today, uh, I was very disappointed to read where the, the author spoke about um, the deaths in custody, and he, he used the term, you know, rather than just say death in custody, he spoke of the, you know, the killings. He referred to them as killings. Um, so that sort of thing has got to stop. Um, but, you know, coming back to the Royal Commission, well, you know, in a sense, we, 
the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody did tell us the truth, but it kind of got uh, buried uh, amongst all the other uh, things to come out. And I just want to make one one important comment on this. There was, uh, what, 339 recommendations, I think is the number we keep hearing. And I have a dear friend, a really good bloke. He's a white man, but he has Aboriginal children. And he says, in regard to the 339 recommendations, he just gives his children two recommendations. Stay away from the grog and keep your hands off other people's gear. And, you know, I told my father that, Australia's first Aboriginal police officer. And he just shook his head and said, you know, that's that's very good advice. Um, this is your father you know, here. Yep. Stay away from the, boo from the booze or at least manage it if you are going to um, have a drink. And, you know, keep your hands to yourself. Um, don't, be, don't be putting your hands on other people or their property. Um, yeah, you know, Dad's quote there, which I mentioned in the news.com article. Stop making excuses. And my father has seen what happens over, you know, two and more generations where you have adults make excuses. Um, and it's not good for the children and their children. It's, you know, it's a cycle that's really hard to break. So we need some real talk. Uh, we can have these, you know, uh, the summit that's happening at the moment, but we need to tackle the tough issues. And tell it like it is. I mean, the American psychologist, Dr. Phil, said you got to be prepared to tell it like it is or it will stay like it is. And for far too long, we've been afraid to tell it like it is. Um, but, you know, there in the Aboriginal communities, there are some nasty crimes committed. As you said before, you know, uh, Aboriginal kids, like white kids, they aren't going to jail for stealing a Mars bar or a Snickers. Um, they're usually in there because it's because of serious crime and long crime histories. Now, I I come from uh, Victoria, where our uh, state government is the the most far left as you can be on uh, Aboriginal issues and the the virtue signalling side of things and. Obviously, there's been this uh, Uluru statement from the heart, which uh, calls for a, a people, uh, uh, Indigenous people's voice to the the federal parliament uh, in Victoria. We already have the, uh, the the Indigenous people's assembly, so they've already got that here in Victoria, and they've also announced. Well, it was actually on the day of uh, Dan Andrews' uh, stairfall that they're going to have a standing royal commission to look at historical. Well, to 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 have some historical truth telling about uh, the uh, the supposed crimes that uh, white Australians committed against the, the the Aboriginal people in colonial times, the the frontier wars, and the the transgenerational trauma uh, that that has caused. Uh, that that word, that transgenerational trauma, was was that has been used by by Lydia Thorpe, uh, who's the uh, Aboriginal Green Senator who has been a really uh, poor influence on the, the debate. She claims that her Senate salary is compensation due to uh, trans-generational uh, yeah. uh, trauma. Uh, but yeah. I, I should also mention the, the irony of the Andrews government having a Royal Commission into truth-telling given what's happened in Victoria the, the, the past year, but uh, I digress. It's so... But that's what Victoria has been has been doing, basic, which they want to emulate federally with this Uluru statement. And look, I mean, Lydia's another one. We should, res you know, I, I don't agree with most of what she says, but we should respect the fact that she's got to the position she's in. And she could be saying to young Aboriginal people, hey, look, you know, I did it. You can do it as well, and I'll help you get there. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the comments she's making, or when she's crying about a death in custody. Um, or oh, claiming that for... Pauline Hanson talking about uh, uh, the dysfunction in remote Aboriginal communities makes her feel unsafe in her workplace. 
Yeah, I mean, just absolute nonsense. I mean, get out of politics if, if you're feeling threatened by that. But, I mean, she's happy to cry about her death in custody. Um, you know, Eddie Maguire cries because he had to walk away from his job and she called it white tears or... Um, yeah, that was the term she used, white tears. So I'm not sure what Lydia's, Lydia's tears were. But, but again, like so many of them, it seems only the only black lives that matter are those that you, you can somehow relate it to a white um, institution. Um, and, you know, and the, the custody or jail system, whatever you want to call it, is portrayed as a white system. And therefore, if there's a death there, it must be racist and sinister. And that sort of message poisons race relations, um, even though you know many people are starting to realise it is nonsense, it's a lie, but there's still a few who believe in the myth of the elevated Aboriginal deaths in custody. Uh, there's a big fan of yours in the, the chat here, Jeff Bartlett, who's, who says, hey, Tim, please ask if... Anthony has or ever would consider running for a seat in federal politics. He would balance Lydia in the Senate. No, I wouldn't. I I said to uh, my great mate, Bill Leake, when he was alive, I said, mate, I will never go into politics. I said, if I do, you have my permission to shoot me. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, Anthony, we'll make a pack because I'll never do it as well. And this is why I admire someone like Jacinta Price so much, and I've told her she's crazy for getting into politics, and she knows firsthand, because she's seen her mum go through it, how dirty the business is. Um, but she does have a good point. She said, you know, she's got to do it because, uh, you know, there's so many other dirty players in there, and if she's not doing it, you know, the wrong person's going to get in. So I take my hat off to her for uh, wanting to do it. So Jacinta, I admire you. I still think you're a bit crazy wanting to get into politics, but. I'll back you. Uh, so the answer is no, and I'm certainly not clever when it comes to politics and knowing about the different parties and how they function and that, but I, I appreciate the um, sentiment. I think I can do better work from the sidelines uh, in conversations like this. And uh, Jacinta, she had a, was a hard-fought victory recently against the, the ABC who... Uh, what was, it was there the ABC Central Coast radio program got a a bunch of or oh, uh, proclaimed local louders to 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 smear her during a, her tour up there saying that uh, she should get permission from them before speaking she's now uh, got a, an apology and, and settlement from the ABC yeah and that's fantastic and you know that was you know saying she was racist and divisive and other stuff and Sadly, for the left, for the keyboard warriors, for the Windy Ninjas that I call them, and the Fenderati, as Bill Leak would call them, they just know that the quickest way to shut down any conversation or cancel a person is to accuse them of racism. And so it was so great uh, when Jacinta had that victory. Because it wasn't just a victory for herself. It was a victory um, for all her supporters and all the you know people that think like her and us to, for them to know that, hey, the opponent can no longer just call you racist as a way of shutting you down. They've got to be able to mount an argument against you. And the ABC, they're, they're in trouble just today for a, a misrepresentation with these... Uh, they chop... Uh, chopped and changed a, a video of the, the launch of one of our new Navy vessels yeah to make it look like the uh, the, the governor general and the the chief of uh, the chief of navy were watching the, the 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 twerking dancers there when they were were not and that was that, that was an incredible a miss you'd have to say it's deliberate misrepresentation there that's there's always another uh, abc stitch up or well, one nearly every day yeah and look to, to be honest I was surprised that even the ABC went that low to do that. And uh, this is why I love watching people like Chris Kenny. He always catches them out. Um, so he shows you some of their um, sinister misrepresentations of life. So, you, you know, hope, so hopefully with, with dissenters' victory, 
um, we get less and less of this gross misrepresentation and just try and bring honesty back into the game. Well, we've also seen a, a ABC journalist in the past day claim that uh, the cartoon uh, dog, uh, Bluey, uh, the show is, well, I'm not sure if they said racist, but doesn't have enough uh, cultural diver diversity in it. And, well, uh, you, you mentioned before the, uh, and this is uh, the, the toxic thing about the culture, uh, uh, the identity politics uh, brigade is that eventually they eat their own, they ate Eddie Maguire, and they're also now uh, the the supposed history of racism on, on neighbours. I've read about this in the, uh, the, the, the headlines. I, I'm keeping abreast of it, but I haven't dug too deep into it. But it's just another one of those things. Apparently Collingwood was always really racist and now it's neighbours. Yeah, and now we, we've got um, the Carlton Football Club song yes. being, being seen as, as racist. And look, what I want to know is, I'm really annoyed, look at me, where's all my racism? Where have I copped all this racism? Well, I'm missing out. The only hate I ever get is from fellow Aboriginal people, and that includes ones that are as white as you. They've often got something to say about me. Um, so yeah, where's my racism? Why, why am why am I not a target or a victim of racism? And uh, that uh, Carlton song, which uh, which has been around for nearly what a hundred hundred years now, I, it's it's apparently got such uh, racist connotations that uh, uh, Carlton players Eddie Betts and Jeff Gartlett in. Uh, Aboriginal players uh, sung it loudly and proudly countless times whenever they 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 won a football uh, match. Yep. Uh, didn't they know all these years that they were uh, singing a a tune which its original lyrics were racist. Mm. And look, you know, I think racism. It's um, what's the analogy? It's a little bit like a lady. If you have to look, if you have to try and work it out, it's probably not. Um, did that make sense? <laughs> Uh, should I dare ask you to elaborate? Uh, well, yeah, you know, you, um, if a lady is a lady, it should be obvious. She, she should be obvious, you know what I mean? <laughs> you shouldn't have to think, well, hold on, she did that, then let's look at her. No, if, if you have everything like that, probably not a lady. And so it is with racism. If you have to go through such extreme, sophisticated mental gymnastics, to see a racist angle to that, uh, that says a lot more about the person looking for racism. Um, and at the end of the day, I think Goethe's um, observation from long ago, people uh, find what they look for and they look for what they believe. And so, you know, for the person who believes racism is around every corner, they will find evidence of it in their own mind uh, for it. But Gosh, you know what a waste of energy and resources to try and find r racism in that song. And you know this is this is what the 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 uh, culture wars and the cancel cultures all about is trying to find this racism. Like I said, um, where the hell is my racism? Why haven't I been targeted with racism? I want my racism now. Well. This campaign, uh, ha well, well, I would say, well, uh, uh, this well, app apparently racist uh, song was brought to light by Dr. Stephen Hagen, who's a Aboriginal activist who's also spearheaded the campaign to change the name of, of Coon Cheese to, I think in the second half of this year, it's going to be Cheer Cheese. And he's also not comfortable with Paul's white milk. Mm. I mean, it's, it's just Alan's uh, lollies now. What is that? They're no longer chocos. They're now cheekies. Cheeky, yeah, chicos. No longer chicos. Cheekies. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's just, and you know, it's it's part of the whole cancel culture thing. It's not just uh, Aboriginal. It's worldwide, and it's just ridiculous. So you know, we have all these people being offended 
uh, or claiming to be offended. And why do they do it? Because to feel offended is to feel important. They want to feel important, so they just claim to be offended. And sometimes it can it can pay quite nicely if you if you get offended at the wrong thing and get yourself a good lawyer. Oh, we should praise uh, both Kellogg's and Streets for for not caving in to uh, cancel culture when it was claimed that their Cocoa Pops <laughs> uh, breakfast cereal was racist because it has the the Cocoa Pops monkey. And uh, the the streets Golden Gay Time was uh, homophobic. Uh, now I, I saw recently on my Instagram feed that Kellogg's and Streets have joined forces to create a a Cocoa Pops Golden Gay Time. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was designed as a bit of a up yours to the identity politics uh, brigade. It probably tastes really good as well. And they've got my money. They got my custom. So that's the, 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 the that's the 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 ultimate uh, oh, 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 to to stick it up the identity politics identitarians. You need to eat a cocoa pops golden gay time. Yep, and um, with a bit of coon cheese. Yes, if you can. Well, they're going to become basically vintage now. The 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 coon cheese uh, boxes, and it's an iconic Australian brand. Obviously. We're all aware that uh, over in the United States, Coon had a racial slur uh, connotation, but we always knew in Australia that it was brand of our cheese and well, it was named after one of the uh, William Coon, the, the cheese uh, refiners. And was it uh, the Coon Cheese made numerous ads where they wanted people to remember the, the Coon Cheese brand, but no one was offended and so, well, it was part of the new wave of cancel culture with Black Lives Matter 2.0 after George Floyd's death. Yeah. And That's look, just coming back, to the, coming back to the coon cheese, uh, Independent Man, I don't know if you know in, Independent Man. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I know. He, if, did uh, a, he did a really good segment on coon cheese. So that's worth checking out for the interested viewer. Uh, I... I think we're, we'll be switching to, say, bigger cheese. <laughs> While we're on, I, I might just add this in, but uh, we're, we're also seeing uh, cancel culture when it comes to, well, even our, the, 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 the seats in our parliament because, uh, well, we had the, the inner city seat of uh, Batman here in Melbourne. Now, uh, uh, John Ma John Batman, the the founder of Melbourne, uh, he negotiated with the the local Aborigines to have ownership of the the, the city. But uh, we probably haven't got uh, enough time to go into the the history wars because there's a lot of misrepresentation of uh, early Australian history. There's been uh, 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 there's been evidence that massacres have been reports of massacres have been fabricated, but they renamed Batman because it was a, a seat, well, represented by, well, it was a con it's a contest between Labor and the Greens, so they renamed it uh, Cooper. And uh, we have the, the seat of uh, Western Australia, Sterling, being abolished because of its namesake apparently being involved in crimes against Aboriginal Australians. That's not picked up on much, the fact that sort of these these seat names uh, or who they're named after are being cancelled in our democracy. Yeah. Um, and look, it's, a, it's another one of those things that is just a waste of time and it is damaging to people. And can I just talk about that for a moment? Yes. It's damaging. Like so many of these things that we're wanting to cancel or change the name of or whatever, uh, like Australia Day, classic example. When you tell people it's you know it's bad origins or, or whatever, and it's hurtful, you're actually telling people that that ice cream, that national day, that football club song, whatever, has got more power over your emotions than what you have over them yourself, okay? and that's extremely disempowering. Let people know that their emotions are controlled by whether Australia Day is on the 26th or the 27th. Um, 
you know, seeing gollywogs in the, the shop store or whatever. Okay. Let people, they let people think that um, they're so delicate, they're so fragile, so gullible, that they have no control over their own emotions, I think is a, a crime. So that's my take on it. And now we have, if we uh, elaborate on the, the latest episode in the History Wars, basically Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu attempting to completely re rewrite the whole of uh, ancient Australian uh, uh, pre-British Aboriginal history. Yeah. Um, Tim, you're, you're across quite a few subjects in this area, so uh, congrats to you with that. Look, uh, there's a book coming out very soon, Peter Sutton, who wrote The Politics of Suffering, an excellent book for anyone who's not afraid to acknowledge that um, there was a lot of violence in Aboriginal communities before the white men arrived, okay? Because, you know, again, another one of the popular narratives out there, or convenient, convenient narrative, is that the violence we see in Aboriginal communities was brought here by the colonizers or the invaders yeah, if you prefer yeah. the uh, violence was there long before the white men arrived anyway so great book uh politics of suffering peter sutton's done it again a book is coming out in uh, june i think this year where he just takes a, a close look at um what pasco was saying and it's going to be very interesting to see if um if Sutton's book is given as much airtime and space as what Pascoe's book was given. And so I'm, you know, I'm certainly not going to um, fight fire with fire and, and say that Pascoe's book should be cancelled, taken off the shelves. I'm happy for him to do what he's done. But others should be allowed to challenge it, like, um, you know, um, Peter Sutton, for example, and there's been a few others that have done it. But it'll just be interesting to see um, if the ABC and some parts of academia give as much time and space to Peter Sutton's book, which ch directly challenges the Dark Emu story. Or well, maybe uh, Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu, it shouldn't be cancelled, but maybe moved into the fiction section of libraries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, again, he has the right to do it, but uh, we should question the people who promote him. You know, the ABC, for example, are they going to promote Peter Sutton's book? Very unlikely. Uh, yeah, I, th I think you can probably preempt the the outcome of that. And well, there's also the question of well, the the doubt about whether uh, Bruce Pascoe himself is uh, Aboriginal. There, uh, there was a comment earlier in in the in the chat i'm not sure if i can dig it up here about uh the 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 the, the criteria uh th that's been set out to or uh, to identify and be accepted as an aboriginal australian and as the last census showed there is more and more aboriginal australians because well aboriginal australians a uh, well uh reproducing with other uh races and ethnicities in Australia as well. So there's obviously more more people in Australia which, uh, going back, have Aboriginal ancestry as well as lots of other different ancestries yeah. as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's a, obviously a, a touchy issue, that one on identity. It's one I, I don't mind talking about. Um, you know, I can get myself into a bit of trouble. And I just think, you know, if, if Pax, Pasco wants to claim Aboriginality and not provide any evidence for it, um, people should be allowed to question him. But, you know, he should sort of come back with some solid answers. Uh, and, you know, he can't just rely on the fact that Ken White or Marcia White Langton endorsed him as being Aboriginal. This comment here, Aboriginal is an offensive word, which why is, there, and I'm guilty of it as well, the, 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 the terms Aboriginal and Indigenous, they're often used interchangeably. The, the reason why, because Canada refers to, well, uh, it's Aboriginal and Indigenous people. 
I mean, obviously the uh, well, one of the reasons why that why why that term is used in Australia is because Aboriginal Indigenous Australians are not one blob; they're made up of multiple well hundreds of tribes. There's no one Aboriginal people. Yeah, um, and it seems today's Australian Aboriginal people too are made up of many ethnicities when you look at um, their ancestral backgrounds. Um, but anyway, possibly, look, why that the word Aboriginal, I don't know if that person was joking or not. But they were probably being sarcastic. They, okay, they often yeah. are. Yeah, and look, I have, you know, one of the reasons I've heard Aboriginal is, is um, I've heard two reasons. One, it was, it was a, you know, a word given to them by the white man. And I've also heard, you know, AB means not. So it means not original. Um, and I think that just illustrates that you can find offence with just about anything. And it doesn't matter what, it, like First Nations seems to be the uh, preferred term today. And I don't have a problem referring to First Nations people, but I wouldn't be surprised if in three to four years' time someone finds something to be offended by, and you know, a, an Indigenous, Aboriginal, First Nations person, whatever you want to call them, find something to be offended by that term First Nations people. So, you know, watch this space. Um, in a few years' time, you might want to come back to me and say, Anthony, you were right. But today, First Nations people, happy to use it. It's well accepted. I don't have a problem with it. But I wouldn't be surprised, you know, people looking for something to be upset by, something to be offended by, will find that it's offended for, it's a, an offensive term for some reason. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, it's like how if you say "coloured person," that's uh, considered a a, a, a old-fashioned uh, racist term. But if you say "person of colour," that's the 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 woke term. You're a okay using that. Yeah. Well, I was um, twenty years ago. I was in America, and at that time, I I had read every Martin Luther King book. I loved Martin Luther King books, and so use of the term "negro." was fine for me i thought it was and so i was with these friends in america and i just innocently with good intention said can you tell me about the negro population you know how they're doing what are they like and this friend said anthony you don't say negro that's wrong um, and i didn't know because i was only going by what martin luther king was saying um, so, you know, apparently it was okay when Martin Luther King used the term and others used the term, but then language evolves, we go through different stages, we find something new to be offended by, and uh, so one day Negro's fine, the next day it's not fine. So, you know, that's part of my reason for thinking that one day uh, First Nations persons will no longer be considered an acceptable term. And okay. I thought, can I, if I can just add one thing, if I can just add one thing, I very proudly identify as part Aboriginal. And I'm told often, no, you're not part Aboriginal. That's a very offensive term. Uh, well, take your fence and stick it where the sun doesn't shine. You know, it's I, I gladly identify that way. It just recognises that I have mixed ancestry. Of course, the, the NAACP stands for National Association of Advancement of Coloured uh, Persons. That's still its name to, today. And I remember it was a few years back that, well, Erica Betts got into trouble for, for using the word Negro when describing Clarence Thomas as a Negro justice and the ABC presenter got quite offended at him. But if you go back to, I was this, uh, 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 just when I was flicking through poli uh, old political things on, on YouTube, I watched the presidential debate in 1960 between JFK and, and Nixon and JFK is talking about the 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 welfare and advancement of the the Negro population yeah yeah so again that was the common term used um, and people don't say JFK uh, was a racist in fact he's a hero uh, of civil rights uh, you know it wouldn't be surprised if uh, it, it'll only take one person to decide he was racist because he used it you know we've we've had institutional racism structural racism casual racism we've now got this what i call a retrospective racism where we can look back on something 
and declare that it was racist. Um, so, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if one day um, JFK is seen as being racist for using the term. Um, Martin Luther King could even be accused of being racist against his own, pers own people because he called them Negroes. The reason that it appears to me why this identity politics, renaming things, change the date campaigns are so prominent these days is because, well, virtue signaling is the easiest form of, of activism. You, what the, yeah. you, you just march in major cities every January 26th saying change the, change, change the date, to wear, wear, wear some T-shirts. Well, what you and I talked about at the beginning about uh, youth crime in uh, remote Aboriginal communities, uh, the obviously how to advance economically these communities, how to uh, crush the cycle of poverty and dysfunction. They're really hard to solve. And Absolutely. So yeah. And I've been saying this for a long time. Why do people do it? Because it, it is so easy just to do that. And, you know, for the person who's sitting back in their comfortable chair uh, in their air-conditioned room, they, they might be feeling a little bit guilty about what I can do to help those Aboriginal people who are disadvantaged, they can just virtual signal and say, yeah, I oppose Australia Day. Or, you know, the really easy one is just to say, I oppose racism. That was racist and I oppose racism. Ah, I feel so much better now. But yeah, it's very easy. These things are easy. Actually, you know, putting food on the table, taking kids out of harmful um, environments, uh, putting adults into jobs, that's really hard. Very, very hard. And a lot of this virtue signalling, when it is translated into political policy and even into constitutional reform proposals, can, uh, result in unintended consequences which actually make uh, the problems worse. Mm. Uh, for, for example, what were you thinking of? I was, I was uh, talking about the well, the the stolen uh, generations narrative. Let's just call it that without getting into the issue. The fact that it has been so so stigmatized, uh, removing well, Aboriginal children from abusive, dysfunctional Aboriginal parents. That we're leaving children in very harmful situations. Uh, absolutely, and. You know, this there was a story in the Australian newspaper about a month ago now. It was just absolutely heartbreaking. Um, a, a young child with Aboriginal ancestry was living with some foster parents who cared for her and loved for her, loved her, loved her. The only parents she had ever known, they had her since she was one. The biological family, which, you know, members were seen unfit. Um, suddenly wanted this child and uh, government intervened. And of course, we don't want another stolen generation, whatever that means. Um, and this child got removed from her loving foster parents who just happened to be the wrong culture. Now, uh, kids just need an environment of love, and love doesn't come in Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal varieties. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. and. Um, it's been encouraging to hear Indigenous leaders like Warren Mundine, Mick Gooder, Sue Gordon, you know, have all said, you know, enough is enough. Um, you can't just use that as a reason for not leaving a kid with a, a not leaving an Indigenous kid with non-Indigenous carers. You know? If those carers can provide love and nurturing, great. Same as if there's a non-indigenous kid placed with indigenous carers. I don't. I wouldn't mind that. And I, within my circle of friends, I don't know one of them who would be opposed to a non-indigenous kid being placed with non-indigenous carers. A non-indigenous kid being placed with indigenous carers, so long as they knew that that kid was being cared for and loved. Well, I think one of the most recent inspiring stories about uh, somebody. Well. I 
working well, working hard and the 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 will to well uh, see that there was more to life in a remote Aboriginal community or Indigenous community, I should say, is uh, Anthony McDonald uh, Tip and Woody, who's the the Essendon player. He wanted to, well, he he knew that there was more to life outside of his small uh, re remote community, and well, he's he's named himself uh, McDonald after he is well, he considers his adoptive white mother when uh, uh, took him to the city, and now he's one of the most celebrated. AFL players, and he's he's glad that she came along, and he's proud of his achievements. We're all proud of his achievements, and so are Essendon supporters. Mm. And, and yeah, I've met other people in similar situations who are grateful uh, for what they have. You know that they consider themselves stolen. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, uh, chatting with you tonight, Anthony. I think we covered pretty much uh, all the, uh, the the current uh, issues uh, in uh, Aboriginal affairs and, and justice that we uh, intended to, to cover. It's been great to have you on Wilmsfront for the, for the first time. I interviewed on uh, my previous show, The Unshackled Waves, when uh, we were discussing when uh, Kerry ann was called... Uh, racist by by yumi steins uh, because she was yeah. talking about the well the the virtue signalers on australia day not worrying about uh, not not caring about the rape and domestic violence going on in aboriginal communities which was did, did, did you interview years. me yes that was two years oh. ago okay oh a lifetime ago and like i said so, earlier i don't think i've i don't think i've uh been interviewed by anyone who's been so across so many topics in Aboriginal affairs and identity politics as yourself. Uh, well, I run a news website and uh, we, we cover the, you obviously have to, to be across your, your brief when you're, you're commenting on these sort of sensitive issues. So uh, it's important, but uh, thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, Take Tim. Been a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.